I'm going to start off with a, a story here. It's a real life story. Uh, so I'll begin with this. So I just flew in last night from Hawaii. I was in Hawaii, and it was actually for business purposes. And I was presenting research at an academic conference. And how I ended up going is actually very interesting. Naturally, who wouldn't want to attend a conference in Hawaii, right? Um, so I had a, co had a colleague tell me about it in passing, and I was like, how do I get into this conference? And so I found out that it's at the beginning of January, which is perfect because I just started my sabbatical from Biola. So if you're here for the first time, I, I am well, really multi-vocational, but I'll, I'll say bivocational because I'm a professor at Biola University. That's, uh, I've been teaching there. This is my 10th, just got my 10-year uh, appreciation recently. I've been there for 10 years. Um, and I enjoy it. I like working with students. It's fantastic. And so now the purpose of a sabbatical is to do research. So the conference essentially helped to jumpstart my research. I said, this is, per this is perfect, right? So I'm, I'm actually off from Biola formally for this semester and through the summer. And it gives me an opportunity to set my own schedule relative to them and to research the things I'm researching. So I'm researching in my sabbatical to prepare for a book pu publication. And this book that I'm preparing for and writing, it's comparing the filmmaker, Quentin Tarantino, with the novelist, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Now, I'm not going to go into their backgrounds if you don't know about them very much. But if you know about them, you can maybe kind of imagine why I would, might put them together. One is a filmmaker. The other is a novelist who wrote in the 19th century. She worked the book. This is really important. She worked Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's a really important book that arguably had an effect on bringing about the, the, the Civil War and ending slavery, arguably, right? Um, but it's a really interesting book for a lot of other reasons that I won't get into right now. And Quentin Tarantino, if you've seen his films, he's a really interesting guy, isn't he? Okay, so anyway, and I've actually published an essay uh, that, uh, where I compare the two, and the essay specifically compares Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained. How many people saw Django Unchained? Okay, it compares Django Unchained with Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, right? And so this is an essay that's part of a collection of essays from other scholars, and it's titled, here's the book title, Weird Westerns, Race, Gender, Genre. That's the name of the book, okay? And my essay is titled, Uncle Tom's Cabin Showdown, Stowe, Tarantino, and the Minstrelsy of the Weird West. Now, none of that may mean anything to you, not a scholar, okay? But my essay's in there. Now, if you, if you, if you happen to check out the book, all I want to say is that it's not a Christian book. <laughs> and my essay is not a Christian essay, okay? Now, it's not an unchristian essay, okay? But it would not be sold, let's just say it wouldn't be sold in Christian bookstores, I'll say that, okay? And my colleagues who publish in the book as well, they're not necessarily Christian either. So if you end up reading the book, it, it, it's not a hymnal, okay? That's all I'll say. Okay, so hey, I'm a pastor, okay, but being a pastor is not who I am. You understand that? It's just I'm equipped, it's a spiritual gift that God wields to pastor you. But it's not who I am. One day I won't be a pastor, but I will still be me. You see the difference? Okay. So, why do I study Quentin Tarantino and Harry Beecher Stowe? Well, because I'm interested, and I'm, I'm going to share with you a little bit about myself as a scholar, as a professional. I mean, I was, I was, so I'm, I'm well, I was well established in my field as an English professor before I became a pastor. So in some ways, that's, that's almost more my job than this job in that sense, right? Because that's the, that's where my training is. I've not been to seminary. I'm not bragging about that. I'm just saying that's not where my training is. My training is in literary scholarship, especially 19th century American literature, some specialties also in African American studies, those kinds of things, right? So my research is interested in studying iconic white artists, especially ones we would regard as particularly innovative and whose work incorporates or is significantly influenced by black people and or black culture. And so my research interest is inspired by a nonfiction book published by Toni Morrison. Most of us know about her through her novels, her fictional pieces, but she's, have you ever seen Toni Morrison interviewed? She is a smart woman. 
but she passed away, so she, uh, but, but she's smart, I mean, and so anytime you see her writing in her scholarship, it's just brilliant, right? So she, she wrote a book called Playing in the Dark, in which she makes a statement that when I read it, it articulated a sentiment that I had held for a very long time, but didn't have the words until I saw her writing. And so here's what she says. She says this. She says this in Playing in the Dark. She says, quote, I was interested, as I had been for a long time, in the way black people ignite critical moments of discovery or change or emphasis in literature not written by them, unquote. And so when I read that, I said, wow, this is, this is profound, right? And you can see how it would further fuel my curiosity, which is really what a researcher is. It's curiosity in action. And so now you also understand the context for what I presented in Waikiki. That's where I was. I was in Waikiki talking about Tarantino, Quentin Tarantino. So at this particular conference, I discussed Tarantino, but instead of comparing him with Stowe, remember I said, stay with me, I'm going somewhere, okay? Stay with me. So, but instead of talking about Harry Beecher Stowe, I compared him with Flannery O'Connor, okay? Now, Flannery O'Connor was a white Southern Catholic writer, and a prodigy, she's an amazing writer. She's brilliant, I mean, she, and she died young. She was like 39 when she died, she had lupus, and she died, but she was amazing, right? But she's also one for whom black people played a curious role in what she published. Why is all of this important? Well, one, I almost did not attend the conference. Now look, I, I'm a busy guy, so if you can imagine, I, I'm applying to this conference at the last minute, right? And so it, was now, it had now become the evening before the abstract is due, and an abstract essentially is a brief summary, sometimes a paragraph, sometimes a full page of what your research is. You send it into the conference, and they determine, if, if they determine whether or not it applies to the theme or whether they want to have you present. So I have to write this abstract. And it is the evening before, and at this point I was tired, and it was you know, getting toward the latter part of the year, and I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe I just won't go, I mean, you know. I got other things going on, right? And so I said, well, if I'm gonna do it, I'll have to get up early in the morning. I'm a morning person. So I said, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go to bed and then I'm gonna set my alarm to get up at four to finish this abstract. Well, I set my alarm for four and went to bed. Now I wake up in the morning, but it's not because of the alarm. I'm just up and it's dark, so it's early. It's before four o'clock. Now, sometimes that can happen because you know, you're excited about something or sometimes you ever did this before, you just set your biological clock, you just say, I gotta get up at three, and there you are. Right? It's amazing how the body and mind works, right? So sometimes that can happen, but, 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 and maybe that contributed to it, but there was something else going on here. Because as soon as I wake up, I was immediately alert to the Lord. And I could sense his impression on me that he was behind me waking up. It almost was like, get up, you gotta finish this abstract. Wow, okay, so I got up and, and, I, and I knock it out because the rest of my day is full. I've got meetings, I've got things at Biola, i got things at the church, i got things at home. We're going to do something special with the kids in the evening, and it's, it's just a lot going on. i got to knock this out in the morning and send it off. And that I did. And it got me excited, and I was like, wow, there must be some purpose to my trip. If the Lord is waking me up, I mean, what does God have in mind? Will there be a publisher there who will be interested in my work? Will there be some other networking opportunity? Maybe there's someone God wants me to evangelize. I, I can only imagine. And all this is going on in my mind, and then what tops it off for me is that my alarm eventually goes off, not at 4 a.m., but at 4 p.m. I didn't set my alarm right, and it left to my own devices, I would have overslept. The Lord woke me up. And I'm thinking to myself, what is going to happen at this conference? So needless to say, I was accepted to the conference and attended it. And yes, it was in Hawaii, but the first half of it was stressful because as you know, I was doing stuff at the last minute. So I was writing my talk up until minutes before the presentation. It was like, oh man, I'm at, I'm at Hawaii doing homework. What is this, man? <laughs> I, I actually, when I got there, I got up at two in the morning in Hawaii so I could finish, you know, finish my talk. And I didn't want to look, you know, unprofessional when I was there. So I had to get, get it together. It was actually pretty stressful. And to be honest with you, I was so happy when it was over because at once, because as soon as it was over, man, I, my gear shifted. 
I popped off my loaf. I popped off my loafers and put on my sandals. I'm strolling through Waikiki. I'm eating what is it? Poke? Is that what you call it? The, the, the raw fish? It was delicious. I enjoyed a, 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 a one of those one of those guys who twirled the six with the fire on it. I watched that. I watched the fireworks show on the ocean. I watched the sunrise. I had breakfast on the beach. I'm living the life. So I'm sure you're wondering, as was I, what in the world did God have me do all that for? And to be honest with you, as I stand here right now, I'm not completely certain what the purpose was. But what I do know is this. The experience had the effect of realigning my mental focus and reframing my preparation for the sermon I'm preaching today which is an important sermon because it's not only the first in a new series, but it's announcing our theme for this year. You know how on Instagram you can, make, uh, you can change the posts that are at the top of your page? Uh, Instagram's default mode is to put the posts in chronological order. But, but the first post you upload may not represent the first things you want your viewers to see uh, because if you're conscious of your brand, you may want to be intentional about the viewer's first impression of you. So Instagram allows you to substitute your first row of posts with ones that are taken from other places in the timeline, to put them up front so that they see you as whatever that post is, right? The main thing they see. And you can also do this with story highlights. So there's a place for story highlights and you can pick, there's five slots and you can pick the story slot highlights that will sort of be, signify who you are the most. In the same way, it seems as if God was placing something in my story highlights. He was pinning a post on the top of my page, something I wouldn't normally be thinking about in preparation for a sermon. In fact, I often keep my pastoral and professional world separate as the people in those worlds represent different audiences. As a person engaged in multiple professions, it had been a while since I had placed my research at the forefront of my mind. And the experience in Hawaii had me immersed in the scholarly world and then offered me an opportunity to process it in an environment designed for relaxation and calm reflection. When I began to recollect in those moments of serenity, my interest in linguistics, which is the scientific study of language, I began to recall my interest in linguistics. Let me just say something quickly. Again, I'm giving you a lot of information. Y'all still with me? Okay, we, we still, we moving, we moving, okay? I'm not a linguist. <clears throat> a bit, to be a linguist is the study of language. I, I'm, I'm a literary scholar. So the difference is that linguistics is about how people communicate with each other. And literature is the study of fictional stories that people write. Those are two different things. So, so why am I interested in linguistics? Well, for this reason. Because of A, A, V, that's an acronym that means this, African-American Vernacular English. Now, I wasn't trained in this field, so I consult with people who are. So one of them is Dr. Jamal Muwakil, right? He's actually the nephew of one of our former elders, and his doctorate is in philosophy, but the emphasis of his scholarship is linguistics. He looks at the intersection of race and language. He's fascinated by how people communicate with each other. And the questions that drive his research are this. One of them is this. How do black, black people show up through language? And the second question is this. How do you know who a person is without seeing them, but only hearing their voice? And so naturally, he is also interested in African-American vernacular English, A-A-V-E, which has been called by many names throughout the years. Some of them you know, Ebonics, right? Negro speech, Black English, African-American language. And why, you know, might this be linked to my research? Well, you can imagine, because when Black people speak this way, they are considered to be unprofessional, ignorant, and lazy. But when people who aren't black speak this way, it's cool. 
marketable, and it makes them money. Here's a prime example. Think about some of the words that popular culture associates with Gen Z. I'll give a brief short list here. Low key. Fam. Cap, no cap. Turnt, turnt up. Trippin', bougie. These are words invented in the black world and then popularized and monetized in the white world. They're not Gen Z, that's black people talking every day. And in the words of Taraji P. Henson, the math ain't mathin'. <laughs> Which is a prime example of AAVE, right? Standard English would not say that math is a noun. It would say that math is a noun, not a verb, but you can't, you, it, standard English would say you can't use it like that. But AAVE says no, she's trying to communicate something that won't come across the same way in standard English. She's trying to communicate something that does not come out in a standard English way. So, so another practical example, I'm borrowing this from Dr. Muwakil. If I say, I be in Santa Barbara. That's not the, somebody will say, well, don't, why don't you just say you are in Santa Barbara? Because that's not the same thing as saying that I'm, that, that I'm currently in Santa Barbara. That's just not what that's communicating. Nor is it even communicating that I'm often in Santa Barbara. There is a tone and even a different kind of relationship I establish with the listener when I say I be, as opposed to I am or I often. And all languages do this kind of thing. There are words and phrases in Spanish, for example, that have no English translation. You have to know the culture. If you don't know the culture, you, I, just, I, just, I just can't give it to you in English. There's no English word that will give the emphasis or the intonation. You just, just got to understand my folks. So when black people communicate with A-A-V-E, it's not a reflection of ignorance, but a reflection of intelligence. We have to take A-A-V-E just as seriously as we take Spanish and standard English. It's part of our multilingualism. So why am I saying all this? Because our, themes for this, because our theme for this year comes from African-American vernacular English. And the word is grown. Grown. Now, grown is also a word used in standard English. So whether it becomes A-A-V-E depends on the context. So the way you would hear this in an African-American context is this way. For example, man, he, man, he's grown. Or you might say, she's grown. Or if we wanted to give it emphasis or make it more matter of fact, we would take out the verb and say, they grown. He grown. She grown. And then there's this, if you grew up in an African-American household, you probably heard some adult tell you this before the age of 18. You know what it is. You ain't grown. You ain't grown. You see, no one starts a conversation with that statement. It's always a response to a child who thinks they know more than they actually do and is trying to school you on what they're going to do. Though they have no job, they pay no rent, and have no plan. So you say, you ain't grown, which is usually followed by the statement, what you're not going to do. Also A-A-V-E, okay? So if you're a child experiencing this, it fosters curiosity, doesn't it? I mean, specifically, you ask yourself, wait a minute, what does grown mean? How do you get to be grown? No one tells you this. 
Some adult determines that you are or are not grown, and that's it. So I've surmised that in an African-American context, grown is two things. The first thing it is, is age. Let me tell you something, and I'm, I'm speaking in generalities because this is not true of every African-American household, but in general, and historically, in the African-American community, minors have no privileges. You understand that the whole thing is about respect. In fact, you understand as a child that your mission in life is to respect your elders. Everything else is optional, but what you must do or what you not gonna do is disrespect me. That's what's not gonna happen. Now this, I can go on and on about this. This is an aspect of our culture that goes all the way back to slavery. I'm not gonna get into that. But if you are a child, you own nothing. You have a say in nothing. You have opinions, but they mean nothing. And the issue of respect is so important to the African-American community that we get mad when we see other people parent. Oh, we get angry. It, it. And we get really mad when white parents, when we, see, when we see how white kids speak to their parents. Oh, we get mad. We can't, we can't take it. We're like, oh, I wish my child would say that to me. You pacing the floor. It ain't even your child. They ain't even bothering you, but you like. You be like, they better get their child or I'm going to discipline them my blankety blank self. We are hardcore with this. Quit playing. We ain't got time to mess with you. Now, the funny thing is that this age criterion is, 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 is that it's like this. It's weird because when you've reached a certain age, before you've reached a certain age as a black child, whatever that age actually is, nobody tells you, right? You're nothing. You're absolutely nothing, right? You know nothing. You have no authority. You have no ideas. But then when you reach that certain age, whatever it is, nobody tells you, grown is just thrust upon you. You can't escape it. So it's like, I'm not picking up after you. Why? You grown. You can't stay here. Why? You grown, get your own place. So this is really articulating the second criterion for grown, which is this. To be grown means that you have business. You have business. What do I mean by that? I don't mean business as in making money or having a corporation. I mean business as in you have things to take care of. People who aren't grown don't have personal business. They are part of someone else's business. You ever seen the, the watch the, 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 the play or now the movie Fentus? Remember the father talking to the son? He's like, listen, I take care of you, not because I like you, because I got to be right by you. That's it. Ain't no love and like a part of it. You just part of my business. That's why I'm taking care of you. And he tells his son, don't worry about people liking you. You make sure what? They are right by you. See that respect issue? So parents, I take care of you because you're my business. But when you're grown, you stop being my business. Now you have your own business. <laughs> and here's the thing. Even if what you're doing is unethical, as long as it doesn't affect me, that's your business. And the sentiment is, I'm not going to judge you. Why? Because that's your business. That's not my business. But what we're actually...
actually saying is something else because we do things that aren't unethical, that are unethical. And we can deflect judgment by saying, hey, that's my business. They grown, that's their business. Leave them alone, they're grown. I don't know what they're doing, maybe, I don't know. That's their business. And we can say that's my business because, hey, I'm grown. But I think you can see the challenge with this. Because our concept of adulthood has nothing to do with maturity. In other words, what we mean by grown is different than what God means by growth. So we have to expand our concept of grown to include God's concept of growth. Hence, the title of this series and our theme for the year, which is this. Grown, embracing, healthy, Christian adulthood. Embracing, healthy, Christian adulthood. Embracing, healthy, Christian adulthood. Now I'm actually going to take you to a scripture. How about that? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. I'm going to read this at length. Beginning in verse 11, it says this. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, or pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Verse 15, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to what? Grow up. In every way into him who was the head, into Christ. Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That distills God's concept of growth for you and for us. Notice if you look at the passage, there is a place for individual growth, right? It says, for example, when it talks about so that we may no longer be children, individual children, right, spiritually, right? But then it talks about our collective growth. So God's concept of growth for you is embedded in God's concept of growth for us. It's interrelated. You can't be a Christian by yourself. You can't thrive by yourself as a Christian. There's no individual Christian plan that can just sit there and, and sit independently. We are growing together. We are going together. And God is going to help us grow together. Now, God is a different kind of parent. He's not mocking us for being immature, nor is he thrusting responsibility upon us without preparation. But he is going to keep it a buck. Actually, he's going to keep it more than a buck. We are biological adults, yes. But there are parts of our lives, spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, relationally, financially, that didn't grow with our bodies. And internally, we're still 11, we're still 15, we're still 8. Stumped growth because of traumatic events, the lack of healthy parenting, and the absence of spiritual intervention in moments of crisis. So what happens is that as a substitute for growth, we create survival techniques that numb the pain and that give us the capacity to be functioning adults. Not mature adults, but functioning adults. That means we can drive, we can go to work, we can pay bills, we can get married, we can have kids, we can even serve in the church, and even present some visible markers of success without actually growing. Without actually maturing. 
without actually developing. But it keeps us safe, or really offers a false sense of security based on external markers of success. And so what happens is that there are things in life that keep evading us, patterns of destructive behavior that keep emerging, relationships that keep getting fractured, financial difficulty that keeps surfacing, gaps in our educational journey that never get closed, spiritual habits that we never master, healing that we never secure. Why? Because there are things in life we will never get until we grow. There are things in life we will never get until we grow. There are things in life we will never get until we grow. You can't buy it. Fame won't give it to you. You can't like likes and subscriptions. None of that will get it. You have to grow. Oh, I want my marriage to be better. You got to grow. Oh, I want, I want to get promoted. You got to grow. I want to make more money. You got to grow. Growth will cost you your concept of grown. Your business is God's business. And your business is actually our business. You know why? We're in it together. Case in point, we're in this with Portia. We're in this together. The whole body has to be nourished. We help each other. But you can't help anybody if you're not what? Growing. That's God's commission for us this year. And I'm, honored, I'm just going to tell you, it's not necessarily going to be comfortable. And I don't mean like in like I'm necessarily going to be brash or, you know, there's necessarily topics that are going to be explosive. It's just that, you know, what comfortable means to us is that we've got our, we, we're functional. We got our life set. This is how I do life. And I want more, but if it costs me my system, now you got your system, you wake up in the morning, here's your coffee, you know, you drive a certain thing, you do this, it's, 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 it's all set up. Why are you messing with that? God wants to mess with that. Why? Because he wants you to grow. He wants us to grow. And there's some things, as I said last week, there's some things he has for us. There's some things he has for you that he's not going to give to you. He's going to give to us. And then you'll experience it by being part of us. Now, when I say that, I don't mean, you know, you've got these churches where the spiritual leadership is super controlling. It's cultish, and they tell you everything. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. You, you grown, right? You do what you want to do. Grown folk do what grown folk want to do. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm saying that you're voluntarily submitting to his leadership, and Jesus is leading a flock. We are a flock, and we move how? Together. That means that you're going to be more constrained than you normally would be. You're going to be more excited than you normally would be. You're going to be more committed than you normally would be. Why? Because you're part of what? A flock. And what he's doing with us is going to be part of your growth. Now, you have to work that out, and, I, and I'm, I'm not, this is not some... Uh, secret message to talk to people who are watching online because I recognize that 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 you know people who watch online they're in a variety of circumstances some people this is this is supplemental for other people their lives are such way. that's the way they do it and some of us we have a hybrid life we, are, we understand all of that so I'm not secretly talking about that but what I am saying is that if you're not with us and by with us I mean heart because if your heart is with us, you'll do whatever needs to be done physically. But it's your heart with us. But with us, it means with what Jesus is doing with us as a church. He is growing us, and there are some things he has in store for us that we can't even receive until we grow. Growth is slow. It's not fancy. It's not exciting. It's just, you ever sit there and try to watch a plant grow? You just, I'm going to just sit and watch, I'm going to see it, you know, grow an inch. It, it take, it, you can't. You just have to go do something else and come back. That's what God is going to do. But guess what? As a result, we're going to be healthier. We're going to be stronger. We're going to have more joy. We're going to have more peace. And the people in our lives will have more joy and peace because of the joy and peace in us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you and praise you for the trajectory that you have us on, a pathway for growth. And as we, this month, we sit down and consecrate, we, 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 we fast, we uh, pick 
days in our week where we're not going to eat food, but we're gonna, you're going to be our food. And we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, speaking to us about those areas of our lives in which we need to draw closer to you and closer to each other. May our hearts be open, Lord, to how you're helping us to be more vulnerable with you more vulnerable with ourselves, more vulnerable with each other so that we can be a community that is reflective of the maturity of Jesus Christ. May people see the love of God and how we show love to one another and that when they see us and when they see us in our act and when they see how we treat one another that they will say yes, those are Christ's disciples because of the love they have for each other. Lord, I thank you and praise you for what this year will be as we grow in you. Now, some of you may be sitting there and you're saying to yourself, listen, I'm hearing what you're saying, but I don't, I don't have a relationship with God at all. But you recognize that you need to have one. I want to give you an opportunity to join the flock. It's, a, it's actually pretty simple, but it requires something costly. It requires you to abandon your agenda, to abandon your making your will the priority over God's will. It requires you to abandon maybe some things that you prefer in, in, instead, and in, in instead to adopt the things that God prefers. And I understand that could be costly, but the benefit is amazing. Or maybe you have been a person who has been a part of church culture, been a part of the Christian community, but you've never actually taken it seriously. I want to give you an opportunity to take it seriously. And, 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 and the way we would do that is I'm going to invite you into a prayer in which you would speak after me. Now if, now, if all you do is repeat after me, really nothing is special about that. That's no more special than a parrot repeating a human being talking. But if in your heart... You have turned from your, you, you've decided to turn from your old way of life and to turn toward Jesus, then something supernatural and miraculous will happen. So if that's you, in either of those scenarios, just repeat after me. Dear God, I acknowledge that I have sinned. Or you might say, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I know that I need the salvation that only comes from you. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood, was buried, was resurrected, and that upon his resurrection gave me the power to live a righteous life. I submit to and confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that for the first time or for the first time and meant it, then something supernatural, something miraculous has happened on the inside of you. You may not be able to see it physically, but something has happened. And if that is the case, man, we want to we wanna follow up with you. Now, there's a couple ways to follow up with you. One is that you can, you, you can speak or pray with someone in person. You don't have to do this, but it's sometimes it's good to have someone in person to talk to after an experience like this. And so, in fact, um, what I'm going to call, I'm going to call up our prayer ministers, if you can come to the stage, and right after service, if you want to pray with them or have them pray with you, you can have them do that. Now, here's another way to do it if you want to remain anonymous, at least temporarily. You can text Zoe Saved to the number on your screen, and we can follow up with you that way. All right? So either of those two methods or both. The, third, the, the, the second thing I want to say is that perhaps as you were uh, praying the prayer, that something, other, something else happened to you that was supernatural, and that is you began to speak a language you didn't understand, which the Bible speaks of or calls speaking in tongues, and sometimes it happens as we're praying like that. That is to be embraced. The Bible says that we are to embrace or covet or desire spiritual gifts. So that's a good thing. And maybe that didn't happen to you, but hey, you, you desire it, okay? It's biblical to desire that. And if you want someone to pray with you about that, our prayer ministers who will be at the front will, um, will pray with you regarding that. And then finally, if you're here and you're saying, what does it mean or how would it mean for me to be a member of this church? Well, I'm glad you asked because uh, we can answer your questions if you text Zoe member to the number on your screen. It is not a commitment to membership, but it is an opportunity for you to learn more about our church and to discern if this is the place for you. With that said, man, it's been a blessing to be before you today.